Hey mechanic students, are you guys ready to go for a swim? I am, it's super hot and it's, ah, it'll be so refreshing to jump in the water there. Anyhow, just like in the lab, we have to be safe. So if we're gonna go for a swim out in that sun, uh, we better follow some basic safety precautions and uh, get our suntan lotion applied, right? All right, I think that's uh, pretty, pretty good. Oh, wait. Oh, we'll have to wait 15 minutes before we go in the water. Well, I guess that gives us time to do a quick derivation uh, to get our equations for shear stress due to torsion and the angle of twist. To get started with our derivation, I have this special pool noodle here. Uh, we have a bunch of lines drawn on there, so hopefully you guys can see all those lines. So basically, we have some lines along the length and we have circular lines around the cross section. And they create these initial squares. Now, we're going to apply a torque to this member and then I want you to make some observations. So this is our initial state and then we apply a torque. Now again, I'll apply a counterclockwise torque at point B here at the end of my member. I want you to make some observations about those squares. So think, you know, about the lines, the, 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 the longitudinal lines along the member, what do they look like, the squares, even at the end of the member, what's happening. So we have some lines, this is the way the lines look initially, and then this is what they look like after I apply the torque. So think about those and write down some of just the observations that you see uh, based on applying torsion to this member. I hope you had time to write down some of those observations or you paused the video to write them down. Uh, now we're ready to move on and to get started with our derivation, we need to draw the displaced shape of this rod. So the first thing to know is that the longitudinal lines along the rod rotate as we apply the torque at B, and they look somewhat uh, diagonal or slanted. They kind of uh, are following like a helical shape around the circular rod as we twist with the torque at B. So I've done my best there to sketch those lines. Next, we want to observe the circular lines. Now, if you go back to the demonstration, you should observe that the circular lines Although they rotate, the circular lines still remain circular after the applied torque. So they still pretty much remain in a circular section. So that's kind of our first observation is that the circular lines remain circular, but that the longitudinal lines are kind of slanted and this slanted longitudinal lines combined with the circular lines leads to the squares, the squares that were initially in our rod, now become parallelograms. And where have we seen parallelograms before? Well, if you remember back to Jello day, remember we took the little Jello block and we applied a shear stress. And that caused the jello block to turn into a, a parallelogram. So that must mean there is some sort of shear stress present in this particular rod. And so that's what I'm just noting here. The torque causes what we would refer to as skewing of the elements along the length. So that rectangular element becomes skewed or becomes a parallelogram. Whenever we have this condition where if you drew an initial rectangle and then after you apply some sort of loading, that rectangular turns to more of like a parallelogram, typically you know that shear stress or shear strain is probably present in that member. The final observation is the radial lines at the end. So if you go back to the demonstration, you'll see that before and after we apply the torque, the radial lines, they rotate, but again, they still remain straight from the center of the rod to the outer edge of the circle. 
So I just want to make that note that the radial lines remain straight. So hopefully you agree with these observations that I made and maybe you even made one or two of those observations yourself. Um, so I hope so. Um, but if not, that's okay. Uh, we now know kind of what to look for when we apply torsion to the rod. And also we, also, we know a little bit more about what shapes to expect when we have shear stress present in our members. So let's take a closer look at what's happening in the planar section of the rod. So I'm going to sketch one of these radial lines. And on this radial line, we have points A and points B. Now, when I apply the torque T0 to the end of this rod, this radial line rotated. And we saw that in the demonstration. We saw the radial lines rotate but that after the rotation, the radial line was still straight. This rotation will cause point B to move to some new point, which I've called B prime. And the radial line will connect B prime back to the center. I can also locate point A prime along this radius. And again, it just means that point A is now at A prime after we apply the torque. Now I want to look at the condition of strain and stress on this element that has in the planar section A, A prime, B prime, B, as well as it has some depth into the page, and that's what I've sketched there. All right, we've talked about strain, and we know that strain is the change in length over the initial length. So if B is moving to some new point, B prime, we now have a change in length, right? It has some sort of change in movement compared to its original location. And we can make the same argument for point A. So this means that there's some sort of shear strain. Now, which point undergoes more displacement? Hopefully you recognize that B moves through a larger arc length than point A. And so that means B undergoes more strain than point A. So we'll say that the shear strain, or uh, correspondingly the shear stress, will increase with increasing distance from the center of the circle. Uh, or more generally, from the center of gravity of the cross section to which we're applying the torque. Now, before we finish with this particular stress profile, I want to add a couple more things uh, just so we can use it in the future uh, to do our derivation. So this torque T0 is causing a shear stress in the element. And so I've labeled that shear stress as tau on the surface of the element. I also want to define the radius of this segment. So we're going to say that the radius to any given point is rho, the Greek letter rho, so that, that's the little lowercase looking p type uh, variable. So rho, or if you would rather use r because you're uh, used to using r for radius, that's okay too. Um, I'm going to probably use rho, so just be aware of that in this uh, derivation. So rho and r is the radius to any given point in the cross section. We also define little c. c is what we term the distance to the extreme fiber of the cross section. And so this is a term that we will use later in mechanics and materials when we talk about bending stresses, the distance from the center of gravity to the extreme fiber. In this case, it's just going to represent the maximum radius. So C is going to be the largest radius or the radius from the center to the furthest portion of our rod where we will have the maximum shear stress and shear strain. To complete our derivation for the shear stress and the angle of twist, I'm going to apply our engineering toolbox of equilibrium, kinematics, and material law to come up with the formulas.
All right, so for equilibrium, I want to focus on what's happening here at the end. And so if I imagine I have a point in the circle and then I rotate, what's happening to that point as we move through? Well, it moves through some sort of distance, right? And we develop a uh, stress that is resisting my applied torque. And then I want you to think like, what's, you know, what's resisting that? So a portion or an element of the material. So this first element here is kind of resisting my force. So we can write an equilibrium expression for that. So let's go ahead and do that. To come up with that expression for equilibrium, I'm going to sum moments about the center of the circle. And I'll take my positive direction to be counterclockwise. So if I do that, I get my applied torque T0 minus my internal torque T has to equal zero. And so I want to come up with another expression for T0. Well, I said that T0 is basically causing that little shear stress tau on every element. And if I think about what torque is, torque is just a bunch of little forces times distances. So if I said that each little force was DF times the distance rho from the center of the circle, and if I added all those up for each every element in the rod, then I would be able to get my total applied torque T0. Well, I know that force, force is really just stress times an area. So I can then write my little differential force as my shear stress on the element, that tau, acting over that shaded area dA. And so again, we're doing everything for the element. That now substitutes for my df. I still have to multiply by my distance rho minus t equals zero. So taking this, I can now write an expression for the internal torque. My internal torque will equal the summation of all of these rho times taus over the area. So this is going to be an area integral. So just think I'm t turning my summation into an integral here. I'll label this as equation one for later use. All right, for kinematics, I want to focus on just this one line that goes along the entire length of the noodle. So again, if I have my fixed end at the right-hand side at the wall and I apply my torque, what does that one line look like? So I have the line and it kind of rotates downward. So if you can almost imagine, this is the initial position and it's shown in as a dashed line in your notes. And then the final position is the dark line as we see it. We should almost be able to see, uh, when you kind of look at it from like a planar perspective, you should be able to isolate that as a triangle. And so we're going to use that triangle to come up with some of our distances. Let's sketch that displaced shape of the line. So if my dashed line shown on the rod is the initial line, and then I apply the torque T0, that initial line will move downwards, and it will end up in the final position shown by the solid blue line. Now, I said I want to isolate a triangle, and I want to isolate the shaded triangle right inside here. So I'm shading that triangle in. We're going to use this triangle to come up with some of our distances for our kinematics relationships. All right, so I want to label the two points on the circle B and B prime that we had previously used uh, in our notes on the last page. So when we apply the torque T0, point B moves to point B prime. If I look at that from a triangle perspective, uh, B and B prime are labeled on the triangle to the right. I also want to identify this angle, the angle here in which the triangle rotates through. This angle is going to be gamma, and gamma, if you recall, is the shear strain for the rod. So gamma will represent shear strain. So physically, the shear strain is this angle uh, gamma that we're looking at along the length of the rod. To come up with an expression for the distance b to b prime, we can say it is equal to the initial length 
times tangent gamma. Or if we assume the rod undergoes small displacements, which is typically true in a lot of engineering analyses, then we can say that the final length is about equal to L, and then we could say that this distance was L sine gamma. In either case, because we will assume that the rod undergoes a small change in angle, uh, and so that gamma is very, very small, then we say that tangent gamma is equal to sine gamma, which is equal to gamma. So this is the small angle approximation from mathematics. So therefore, the distance b to b prime is roughly equal to L times gamma. Moving on to the motion of the radial lines in the cross section, again, I want to sketch b and b prime. And we're assuming small angles, but I'm going to exaggerate the case. So you see, I have a relatively large angle sketched here. If I was to consider the arc length distance from b to b prime, I could calculate arc length as being the radius times the angle through which the radius rotates. That angle we'll refer to as phi. So phi is going to be the angle of twist at a particular cross section in our rod. So we can write that bb prime is equal to rho times phi. Again, if we assume small angles, then we assume that the core distance, the distance represented by the dashed green line there, is almost roughly equal to the curved blue line. So we say that those lengths are approximately equal for small angles. And therefore, we can say that bb prime, the core distance here, is roughly equal to rho times phi. Finally, I want to set the two expressions for bb prime equal to one another. So I'm going to say that L gamma equals rho times phi. And again, I just want to highlight that we've used small angle approximations, but for most engineering materials, especially when we're talking about metals, when we apply torsion to these metal rods, they undergo small amounts of deflection. If they undergo large amounts of deflection, they would no longer be elastic, and then we would have maybe some sort of failure to worry about. Using this expression, I'm going to solve for gamma. So gamma equals rho times phi divided by L. And this is what I will refer to as equation two when I bring these equations together later. So our third toolbox is our material law. So we're going to apply what we said was Hooke's law and we'll apply our shear stress to shear strain relationship. Now we're gonna focus that on the linear elastic range. So let's go ahead and draw our shear stress versus shear strain relationship that we developed a couple lessons ago and then uh, focus on the linear elastic range where we'll develop an equation for the shear stress in terms of the shear strain. This is an easy one. If you remember, we said that the shear stress shear strain relationship looked like this. It had a linear elastic range and then it almost appears to go into what looks like strain hardening and leading to failure. For our mechanics and materials class, we're going to just focus on the behavior in the linear elastic range. So writing an expression in this region, we can relate tau to gamma using Hooke's law for deformation. And so for shear stress and shear strain, they're related using the modulus of rigidity or the shear modulus G. So tau equals G times gamma. This will be equation three. And now we've completed our use of the engineering toolbox. We're getting close, we're getting close. I'm really excited. So uh, all we have left to do is now put all this together, mix some equations around, and we'll have our formulas written. Go for it. I'm gonna speed through this derivation because I'm ready to go swimming, but feel free to skip ahead or pause the video to make sure you get this down in your notes. From equation one, we have our expression for torque in terms of equilibrium. If we substitute equation three in, we now see that the torque T equals the integral over the area of rho G gamma times dA. Now I'm going to substitute equation two in 
4 gamma. And so that gives me that the torque T equals the integral over the area of rho G rho V over L times dA. If we focus at just one particular cross section, we'll note that G phi, the angle of twist, and the length to that cross section remain constant. So we can pull all of these things out of the integral. So then we're left with just g times phi over l times the area integral of rho squared dA. This integral should remind you of the area integral of y squared dA, which was the moment of inertia. In this case, we refer to it as the polar moment of inertia, j, and that's a property of the cross section, and it basically has to do with how much it resists the twist. All right, so replacing the integral with j, I get the following equation for torque, and then I'm going to rewrite for the angle of twist phi. So phi equals the torque T times L over g j. Now I hope that this formula looks very familiar to you. Uh, it should kind of remind us of our Hooke's Law for axial deformations. So just like Hooke's Law said delta equals PL over EA, when we deal with angle of twist, we have phi equals TL over GJ. They even rhyme. So hopefully that helps you remember the formula for angle of twist. Just like we did with Hooke's Law, we can generalize this for any given torque for G and J if they happen to vary along the length of the member. So G could vary along the length of the member if we have uh, some sort of changing material, uh, maybe due to a temperature change along the length. Uh, high temperatures can affect uh, the shear modulus. Or if we have a tapered member, that would affect the area at a cross-section, which would then affect the polar moment of inertia J. So generalizing this, uh, we can have that phi of x is equal to the integral over the length of our function of torque, T of x. So this would be if our torque was changing along the length. Divided by G of x, J of x, uh, integrated with respect to x uh, to account for the length. So in a very general case, this is a good formula for phi, how to find the angle of twist at a particular point. But most of the time, we can isolate this and we can use that first formula, phi equals TL over GJ, and we can isolate this for different segments and just add up the results, just like we did uh, using Hooke's Law for the axial deformation of one-dimensional rods. Next, we want to develop the torsion formula. So this is going to come up with a formula for shear stress. So we said tau equals g times gamma. We substitute equation 2. So we now have that tau equals g times rho phi over L. And then we plug in our new equation 4 in for phi. So that gives us tau equals g rho over L times TL over gj. Uh, do some cancellations, g and g, L and L cancel. And so now we have an expression for the shear stress. So whenever you're asked to find the shear stress due to torsion, this is the formula you wish to use. Tau equals T, the torque, times rho over j, the polar moment of inertia. Um, or, if you're interested in the maximum shear stress, so tau max, we sometimes see that this expression is written Tc over j. Again, where C equals the distance to the extreme fiber, or C equals the maximum radius, rho max. All right, I hope you uh, got those equations down. We're going to be applying them here shortly in a couple examples.